Mm-hmm. Uh, well, that letter that you mentioned, uh, just to, uh, as a side point, was very important, at least uh, in my upbringing, because our mother, who never remarried, kept the letter uh, at all times. She kept it in the top drawer of her vanity table. And she would pull it out from time to time, probably during times of difficulty. And when she did, she almost invariably broke down. And I discovered, uh, when I was a bit older, that it always happened at that one exact sentence. Mm -hmm. Um, That's when she lost her composure. Uh, And I think that's because, well, it's hard for me to say why, but it was an expression of faith in her ability to get through this, if anything should happen to him. And uh, she took this very seriously, and I think her approach was, uh, well, let's continue life almost as if nothing happened. That is to say, the two of them had talked about raising us in the kind of rustic setting in Westport, Connecticut, which in those days wasn't really a suburb, uh, having an ideal childhood out of doors, you know, frolicking in the woods, uh, skating on ponds in winter. I think they painted the whole picture. <laughs> After his death, uh, at a certain point, she moved to Washington, back to New York, and then when we were very young, back to Westport, Connecticut. And she did write a book about this, uh, a, a book called The Children Grew, which um, did not sell very well, but the idea was a kind of anecdotal account of how you raise two kids without a father. In that book, she makes clear her goal was to raise us with both a father and a mother, except she would have to occupy both roles. She would be the nurturer as well as the provider. That is a tremendous weight for anyone. Uh, In her case, having to commute to New York City every day and come back and be a mother and kind of transform from one role to another, uh, I think exerted a great deal of pressure. It's also important that the world they occupied then uh, in the 30s, which was a, a very wild time around New York for newspaper men, was a world of drink. Uh, alcohol was all important to them. Uh, in their letters back and forth, they talk about alcohol lovingly that day when they'll be able to share a Tom Collins under the tree and that kind of thing. So she basically uh, fell into uh, alcoholism, serious alcoholism, and was unable to, uh, to keep that w- role of dual provider and nurturer going. In fact, she was really had to abdicate both roles. And I think later when she read that letter, that sentence may have had a kind of ironic uh, undercurrent for her. And, and in the book, you are uh, constantly kind of, uh, you, 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 you pursue your subject as a uh, diligent reporter. Uh, uh, one of the things I really appreciate about this book was um, that you are always honest about what you remember, what you don't remember, what are conflicting memories, how you try to piece together memories, um, how you even at times, um, as we all do, construct our own memories. Um, In interrogating the memory in particular uh, of your father in terms of trying to figure out who was beyond this myth, these totems you carried, what were some of the things you found in the book, uh, in in your research, um, and and what was most surprising? Well, I I think you're absolutely right. When I set out on this, I thought, well, for this to work, it has to be totally honest, or it just won't, won't fly. And when you're writing a memoir, if if that's the path you choose to take, you can sense if you begin to veer off that very narrow path into the realm of the imagination. And that is something that we all do in our lives. I think we all create our own Uh, self-narratives. I don't like the word narrative now because it's been usurped by politicians, you know, for their (laughs) campaigns. But applied to us as humans, we do have these narratives. And uh, I noticed that uh, I would have a story to tell, a story of my expulsion from Andover. Very, I thought, dramatic. Uh, I was admitted to Harvard. Suddenly, I was no longer going to Harvard. Then I actually got the documentation from Andover, and I learned that, in fact, I probably wouldn't have been admitted to Harvard because I was already messing up and had lost my A rating for Harvard. So I find that point at which the actual truth of the account contradicts or adds on to your own internal narrative is the most revealing 
of all, because there's a reason you want to change it. Mm -hmm. In that case, the reason was to paint myself as a kind of a witless victim of circumstances, which turned out not to be the case. <laughs> In examining uh, my father's role, uh, this was done largely with the help of my brother, Bob, who was an historian, as you probably all know, who is here tonight. Uh, and he... Um, was very interested in the mid-80s in doing a book on our father, but it would be kind of part of a larger book on journalism in the 30s and, and uh, filled with interesting characters uh, and wanted me to join him. And at that point, I wasn't that interested. I had other ideas, and I, I didn't even think the topic was that interesting. But then, uh, in the way these things happen, mysteriously, he gave up on the idea and, uh, and I took the idea. By then, he was on to other projects, and he wasn't interested. But luckily, he had conducted interviews with any number of the contemporaries of our parents who were then still alive, all of whom are now gone. Uh, and he managed, in a kind of dramatic meeting, uh, to meet our father's second wife. Our mother, we thought, was his third wife. <laughs> we discovered a number of things, including the fact that our mother and father were never married, which, for one thing, seemed to pull the rug out under this notion that their relationship was, you know, one of perfection in all its parts. Um, and through these notes which my brother took, uh, I got a sense, uh, a really good sense, of what our father was like. And yes, it is true, I think he was a very debonair man. That was the word that always occurred, <laughs> debonair. Very witty. You've heard of the expression, any man who hates dogs and children can't be all bad. That was not said by W.C. Fields. It was said by Barney Darnton. <laughs> uh, and this is all documented in a book called Dictionary of Misquotations. He also said such things as, home is where you hang yourself. <laughs> uh, and uh, it's not wedding bells, but cheap hotels that's breaking up that old gang of mine. <laughs> so we... This silhouette of a debonair, witty man came through. We discovered, though, that he was kind of catnip toward women, but <laughs> he was uh, probably not adverse to making a pass at a woman after he had a couple of drinks, that he liked to drink, that he was restless, that he was, to some extent, irresponsible and wild. Uh, and that really helped explain uh, a mystery to an answer to a question we never really dared ask, which was, well, why did he go off and leave a woman alone, especially a woman who turned out not to even be married to him, uh, with two young children and volunteer to go off to war? And I think the key to that, a lot of it is this notion of protecting a democracy and everything, but I think on a more personal level, he was probably extremely restless. Now, um, in, in the archives of the Times, you found some interesting things about your father. And, and, and it also gets the myths because it wasn't just the family that created myths. It was others who created myths about your father's death. That was what you found there. Um, and how was it that others, uh, including the paper oh. of record, tried to construct uh, this narrative? Yeah, uh, that was fascinating. When the Times moved, uh, just shortly before it moved to its new headquarters on 8th Avenue, it was in the old building. They moved all the morgue, the, the morgue, the, the archives, down into the basement where the presses had been. So I just went down there every day, kind of like a miner going underground, and got these folders that were arranged by publisher. It's kind of like monarchy, you know, <laughs> Louis the Sixteenth. Everything that happened under his reign was here. Well, in the Arthur Hayes Salzberger archives, we found a lot of material about both my father and my mother who was the first woman's editor. Um, in there, uh, in the early 1950s, a man whose idea is not important suddenly wrote the New York Times, wrote the publisher, in fact, and said, uh, basically, I hear Barney Darnton may actually have been killed by a Japanese plane instead of an American plane. Turned out to be a case of friendly fire. We knew that. It was well established. But this prompted the publisher to kind of order an internal, I don't want to say investigation, but at least a kind of inquiry into what actually happened. Um, as part of that inquiry, Edwin L. James, then the managing editor, produced uh, a news story that the Times killed. They never ran it. It was, pro it was dated in March, probably 
1947. In other words, the war was all over. This was, it was written by a man named Anthony Levera, who was later a Pulitzer Prize winner and an intelligence officer during the war. And he wrote, uh, Barney Dun basically, Danton's death happened as a result of a pitched battle between American planes and ground forces, one of many such incidents of friendly fire during the war in the Pacific. The Times had never owned up to the fact that it was friendly fire. They only said that it was happened uh, in an accident, which was General MacArthur's uh, phrase. Um, the story was not used, and James wrote on the margin, we decided not to run it on grounds that it would do no good, which is really interesting because, uh, you know, basically the paper of record was never really a correcting or at least, ex you know, extending the record to, in, to include what actually happened to their own correspondent. Um, so there were a number of surprises like that uh, in the bowels of the times, uh, including a number of things uh, about my mother, which I hadn't realized. And was there one thing uh, during this quest, as it really was a quest that took you a long time to piece these things together, um, that was most difficult to learn about your father or your mother or something that you struggled to accept once you um, encountered uh, the evidence that, that con con contradicted or challenged uh, your memory or your perception of that? I guess the hardest thing to deal with was the question why they were never married um, because our mother admitted this in the last year of her life when she was already ill and dying from cancer in 1968, but never fully explained it to our satisfaction. We had a, a, a walk on the beach, uh, all of us, uh, and she kind of at first made light of it uh, and then kind of said, well, you know, he's very well known um, and you couldn't just go off to uh, appear before a justice of the peace because probably the associated press person in that town would hear about it and write about it. Again, you know, feeding this myth that he was kind of so famous that we, we decided we couldn't do it. And we made, a, we made up anyway an anniversary date, which we celebrated, and we were all, for all intents and purposes, married. Well, um, we didn't really buy this. Uh, so uh, I did some research on um, their divorces. Divorce records are very hard to come by in New York. And if you're ever interested, you better do it quickly, because they're doing what they call weeding. They're throwing them out, basically, uh, including this period in which our parents were divorced. But luckily, uh, there's a kind of confusion in the state Supreme Court building where they're held. They're not supposed to give them out for 100 years, I was told. But I was told to go there and ask for somebody named Mickey. Mickey would help me. And so I went, and Mickey was out to lunch. But Mickey's substitute <laughs> produced the records. And there, I was able to learn uh, that my brother's birthday uh, happened clearly just after our father had secured a divorce from his second wife. So, in effect, she was already pregnant, uh, and that's why they didn't uh, get married. That was a bit of a shock. And then there were some various yarns perpetrated by other members of that group, including his second wife, about the morals of the time that were sort of shocking. I mean, we think, uh, you know, Philip Larkin said sex was discovered in 1963 <laughs> or something. It was really discovered in uh, 1932. <laughs> so once they discovered it, there's no stopping them. <laughs> Do you think after all this research, um, and, and, and it kind of interrogating the past and interrogating the memories and speaking to everyone, that you have a sense of uh, who your father now was? And was I, that one of the goals of the book? It was. It definitely was. And I do. I can't say I filled out the picture perfectly, but before I just had a kind of a silhouette, uh, a stark silhouette. And even many of these things that I learned, I knew kind of subconsciously. I mean, I think I knew a lot of that all along. What I didn't have was an emotional connection. And I didn't feel that really until the very end of the research uh, when I went to